All right. So, you know, as Susan said, I'm, I'm working on a film called Super Meditate Me. Um, and it's in progress, so it's not finished yet. Um, before I tell you about the film, I wanted to talk about the motivation behind it. Um, so right now, the way I see the sort of mainstream cultural acceptance of spirituality is that it's made a lot of advances in the last 20 or so years, I'd say, in that we're starting to see a lot of mainstream science and mainstream culture talking about yoga and meditation without really batting an eye. You know, it used to be 20 years ago that you would say the word yoga and nobody really knew exactly what you were talking about. Um, and they might be a little suspect of, you know, oh, are you one of those weird spiritual people? Um, and I think today, now that's not the case. And that's really wonderful. Um, but at the same time, there's this huge, you know, real, the, the, the real part of the iceberg is spiritual experiences. And I'm sort of using that, that phrase as a sort of umbrella term to encapsulate everything that happens um, or everything that's part of the yoga meditation traditions, um, not limiting, not limited to yoga, you know, and meditation either, you know, uh, Tai Chi and things like that. I'm sort of trying to encompass um, all of spiritual practice. And um, this area, um, give you a few more, few more of those details there. This area um, is really kind of what the whole core of, of spirituality is about in a lot of ways. And it's definitely sort of the motivation for, or the reason why meditation and yoga sort of came to be. Those two practices don't exist in isolation. They exist as part of a pathway and a system uh, for reaching you know, higher consciousness, spiritual, for having spiritual experiences, for, you know, every, everything that comes with those practices, there's a goal in mind. Um, and we sort of haven't, haven't really culturally talked about that goal yet. And so that was, um, that was the starting point where I thought, you know, what if we could try to do that um, in a film? You know, oft, often films, documentary films can be uh, a way to, to forward the cultural dialogue around uh, topics that are otherwise unknown or underappreciated. And so that was kind of where I, where my head was at when I started working on, on the film. Um, and, you know, just to talk a little bit more about that, um, I think the problem is not just that these topics are invisible and, and don't, can't be talked about. It all leads to at least in my case, and I'm sure a lot of others would agree that, you know, if you have a spiritual experience of any kind, it's almost like being abducted by aliens uh, in that you, you have to be really careful who you talk to it about. Um, you know, I know I felt a lot of isolation. I had a sort of unexplainable out-of-body experience when I was around 18. And, um, you know, you talk to people, I talked to people about it and they would react, you know, it was, it was such a mixed bag for how they would react. I could never predict who would, who would say, oh, that's really interesting. Or, or who would say, oh, you know, that's all, that's all in your head. You know, it didn't really happen. You know, you know, there's this part of the brain and, and that's, you know, that's it, that's it. And, you know, so after a while I kind of learned like, okay, I can't really talk about this with, with everyone. Um, and that, that's isolating, you know, that's, um, that's too bad, you know, it leads to, um, um, these experiences should be really, really fostered. And instead, you know, if you can't come out of the spiritual closet, as it were, then, um, you know, you can't really find the help you need, or it may be hard to find the help you need, um, not to mention difficult to find grants uh, and funding in the sciences for something that a lot of people consider to be very fringe. And, um, and obviously, an entire dimension of life, you know, is completely unknown. So, um, that was where my head was at starting to work on what became super meditate me and it's sort of a, a almost a crass title uh you know it's not really the most spiritual sounding title um and that was because we didn't want to i, I didn't want to make a, a spiritual film for a spiritual audience there's there's a lot of those films out there they're absolutely wonderful you know there's films that i love um but what I wanted to do was make a more skeptical film that might appeal to a more skeptical audience, which is where I tend to see the mainstream right now. Um, and so the idea was like, okay, everyone's okay with meditation. 
You know, you, you could talk about meditation now to anyone, scientists, and and really they're not gonna not gonna freak out or think you're weird. Um, and so that's a great entry point into the rest of it. Um, you, once you get people through the door, it's kind of like, okay, now we can talk about what this is all really about. And um, most people have heard that meditation, you know, is is linked to something called enlightenment, and they don't maybe know what that is. Um, their understanding usually stops right there. Uh, you know, big question marks, right? What is enlightenment? How do you get there? Is it even real? You know, um, do I have to spend all my entire life in a monastery to make any progress at all? You know, I um, uh, my some of my siblings think that uh, no, it's sort of a reward for like, you know, you're like granted it by you know, uh, Avalokiteshvara, right? Like somebody grants it to you from on high as a as a sort of tit for tat of living like a really, you know, Mother Teresa kind of life. Um, so there's all of these questions. And so I thought, well, why not? Why don't we just do the meditation? Why don't we take someone who hasn't had any meditation experience, happens to be myself, um, and let's put it to the test. You know, let's see what would happen if an ordinary person tried to live like a monk for, and we started with 100 days, um, we ended up doing more than 100 days. So it's, you know, what would happen if an ordinary person started to live like a monk? And um, so we did that. And along the way, we meet other people who have had these kinds of experiences. Um, we tried to, we sort of like skewed towards people who were really ordinary, um, you know, and didn't kind of totally change their lives as a result. I mean, you have to change your life, I think, a little bit as a result of um, any kind of spiritual experience. Um, and, uh, but we tried to find people who, you know, had formerly been, you know, one of our guys, Scott Hegel, is, was formerly an investment banker, worked for Prudential Capital, um, and then meditated and had this, you know, very classic Kundalini awakening experience. Um, and uh, so, so we, we talked to him, we talked to other people as we go to sort of clear up misconceptions about what this is and what it does to you and, you know, all of these amazing things that can happen. Um, obviously, there's also, you know, some not so amazing things that can happen. Um, plenty of people I've talked to have had, you know, difficult uh, types of uh, spiritual awakenings, whether it's, you know, whether you want to call it Kundalini or, or, you know, whatever you call it, um, they've had a difficult time. And so I think it's important not to kind of completely ignore that, um, you know, but on the whole, uh, the idea is, let's see, let's see what happens um, to these people and, and to me. So I'm going to show you a three minute trailer of the film and hopefully the audio works. I haven't done this in a while, uh, but um, you'll have to stop me if it doesn't work, but I'm going to try to play this and, and you can see what we've got. One of the oldest legends in human history is the idea that meditation can lead to a state of enlightenment. I'd always believed it was only a myth until I came across a phenomenon that made me think again. One day in winter, I was meditating. When suddenly I found an energy rising up from my spinal cord. Well, for many years I wouldn't talk about it. And I think there's a kind of a prejudice against people who have a so-called spiritual experience. One day I was meditating and then all of a sudden I felt like an energy shoot up into my head. My awareness is now like an ocean a mighty self-consciousness. Today, I'm in a much, much, much different state of consciousness. What I wish to make clear is that this state is not the product of magic, nor a miraculous gift won by divine favor, but the direct outcome of a biological transformation of my body. The question was, could you take an ordinary person and could they reach some kind of higher state of awareness through meditation? I decided to live like a monk for 100 days 
I would meditate every day for an hour a day. I stopped drinking. I gave up sex. It was I'm, like, hey, we just got married. I'm now going to stop drinking and um, be celibate 100 days and also meditate. I was like, this is going to be a great marriage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, 7 a.m. on day 12, and I'm about to do my morning sit. We decided to throw a lot of science at it. These are the, the data coming in in real time. This is the part of the brain, let's not forget, not only is the most active across styles of meditation, it is also the part of the brain that doesn't atrophy in meditators. The modern learned world has no conception what it means. It transcends everything that you can have. It transcends all the technology. A man may have no amenities. The moment he becomes super conscious, he is now the emperor. I've been asked many times through the years if this is a good thing to uh, seek. And I have always emphatically said, no, do not. Once it happens, it starts doing you, and you can't do a thing about it. You can't change it, you can't mutate it, you've just got to go with it. They do call Kundalini, sometimes it's called serpent power. I've definitely started something in my body that I can't control anymore. Uh, that's, that's a little scary. Okay, and that's our post reel there. Let's see if I can get out of here. All right. So, um, as you saw in the trailer, uh, I did a 100 day meditation regimen, and it was no alcohol, uh, green tea only. Um, I, I tried to abstain from sex as long as I could, but I'll give you a little spoiler. I wasn't able to do it for a hundred days. Um, and I also did one hour of uh, silent meditation per day. And um, if you are curious to know a little bit more about what kind of meditation I did, we, we took a book uh, called The Secret of the Golden Flower, um, which is a Taoist book. Um, and it was just very clear cut, you know, of all the spiritual books that are out there, I felt it was really very straightforward, very, you know, the Taoist approach is just very matter of fact in a lot of ways, and it made the most sense to me. Um, and so we did that. And alongside that, what we tried to do was conduct um, as best we could a sort of N of one study, which N of one meaning there was one subject, which was me. And normally that's not the greatest thing to do, you know, normally that's a negative in your research paper to have only one subject. Um, but for what we were doing, it actually made some sense. And we were able to find a, a sort of blueprint in a 2012 study um, by a Stanford researcher named Michael Snyder. And what he did was he basically said, um, hey, we've got all these, all this amazing technology now for monitoring uh, your body on in incredible detail. We've got genomics, we've got uh, metabolomics, which is blood analysis. We've got, um, he did a few other things. And, and he said, what would happen if we just did a bunch of samples and looked at how someone's uh, physiology is changing over, I think he did a, a 14 months, he did 14 months. So we weren't doing it, doing it quite that long. But what I wanted to see was, um, what is changing, if anything, in my physiology uh, before and after the meditation? And you, know, you probably saw Gopi Krishna in there, if you're familiar at all with his work. He was really excited about this idea um, toward the end of his life, but never was able to kind of see it uh, carried out. And so I thought, you know, oh, this would be cool because we have this sort of nice lead in um, from this guy saying, hey, you know, what if we found some evidence? of that, that spiritual awakening was um, physiologically based. And, uh, and I agreed, you know, that, that could be really uh, quite, quite uh, transformative for the, for the scientific community and for everyone. If there was some, some data that we could find, it could show, okay, spiritual awakenings, you know, this isn't all happening in our heads. You know, you can try to say that it's a 
hallucination, mental illness, whatever, you know, which is what real hardcore skeptics will say. Um, but, you know, if we found, if we were able to find some, some uh, evidence that, oh, no, there's some actual, you know, physiological growth process happening here, something like that, um, then we could, we could uh, gain a lot of insight into what a spiritual awakening is. And so I thought, okay, well, we can, maybe we can try that. Um, so we did all these samples. You can see the pre and post. Unfortunately, we only got one MRI pre and post, which is not a lot, but we did get a ton of blood samples, um, had them analyzed for, I think is over 2000 unique compounds uh, and 93 post EEG sessions, almost one for each uh, sit that I did, as well as a mountain of behavioral data. Um, and give you a little bit of background on myself. I know Susan already mentioned it. I'm 40 years old, live in San Francisco. I'm a software engineer. And um, I would define myself as spiritual curious. I, I had an experience when I was 18. And um, in retrospect, it might have been a full uh, spiritual awakening of some kind. But at the time, uh, I didn't know what was happening. And I didn't know how to integrate it into my life. And I kind of just wanted it to go away. Um, you know, I was in college, I was trying to focus on my studies and I just couldn't deal with it. And so it wasn't until much later in my life that I kind of turned around and was like, oh, you know, maybe that was sort of part of a spiritual awakening. Um, but I'd never done any meditation at all. Uh, and since that seems to be kind of what all the spiritual books tell you to do, you know, do, you got to do it, right? Uh, and so I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to do it and we'll see what happens. So um, for the first 48 days, I didn't experience anything too unusual. I, I'd say I had mostly just the mundane effects of meditation, which were actually incredible. Um, you know, if you <laughs> Meditating, I mean, part of it was probably I gave up drinking and, and, and green tea. That probably had a lot to do with it. But sitting down for one hour a day absolutely changed my life. Um, you know, as someone who I'm a software engineer, so tech is just sort of how I live and breathe. Um, realizing how distracted my mind had been and realizing how seeing myself go into the meditative state for an hour and then having to go back into the sort of technological maelstrom of my nine to five life was incredibly eye-opening. And I realized, you know, even if you're not going for, you know, major effects or, you know, enlightenment, whatever it is, just getting that sit in, just doing normal meditation is such a boon. And I wished I'd been doing it, you know, after a few days, I was like, God, I can't believe I haven't, I can't believe I'm just figuring this out right now. And I'm almost, I'm almost 40 years old. And um, how amazing this would have been when I was you know, 16, 18. Um, people don't realize that you can shut your mind off. No one knows, I mean, almost nobody. And I didn't know until I started meditating. And turning your mind off is so important in our world today. And realizing that you can step out of this, what I started to think of as the merry-go-round of human culture and human society that is just spinning and spinning and it's like out of control now. And I didn't know there was a way that I could step outside of this. And it just, it's, I, 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 I'm so, I'm so thankful that I did it at all. Um, so, it, and that's what it felt like. It felt like stepping off the merry-go-round and kind of looking at this carnival and just turning around and like walking into the forest where it's quiet and completely calm. And, um, you know, it, after a while, I started to kind of orient my entire day around my nightly sit. I actually did it at 5 p.m. or around 5.30 because I'm terrible in the morning. I can't wake up in the morning. Um, I'm useless. And um, but five right before dinner was just the perfect time. And it was a way to kind of eliminate all the stress of my work day and get into this like incredible state, um, which then became kind of amusing because my wife was not in that state and she'd be, you know, some funny scenes where she's like making dinner uh, and I'm sitting there meditating and then I go and we have dinner and I'm like all blissed out. And she's just like, <laughs> she's not on the same page. Um, so, so you kind of have to like, you know, you can't just like, 
just assume that the rest of your life is just going to come along board with you. Um, and, uh, but, but the distilled mind for me was a new experience that, um, was, was absolutely amazing. That was the first 48 days. Um, oh, the last one, the last thing that happened was I would get the spontaneous euphoria. Um, the, the sit didn't just relax me. It, it made me feel stoned in this funny way where, um, I, I remember I went, uh, we didn't film this, unfortunately, but I went to the grocery store afterward uh, and I walked in and I must have looked like kind of like Buddha eyes a little bit, you know, just, um, I don't know how, how I looked, but I got a lot of stares <laughs> and I, I got back home, you know, I bought dinner or whatever, looked in the mirror and I was like, oh, I actually look like I'm stoned. I look like I, I am fully baked. And um that was that was funny, uh, but it, you know I I felt amazing. You know I didn't feel like cloud cloudy headed at all. I just felt it was just the euphoria, and I thought, my God, you know this is worth it just by itself. This is incredible. Um, so that was the first the first forty eight days, um, and then uh, around day forty nine, day fifty, uh, I I still can't explain this. People who know about the chakras and know about this stuff more than I do would just say, oh yeah, well, of course you were going to light up your chakras. Like, what did you think was going to happen? You know, but I didn't actually think like I had no, I knew a little bit about, you know, this idea of Kundalini. I thought maybe it's going to go up my spine. I'm going to have this like, you know, blast off experience. I really didn't think the chakras, the chakras were real at all. I actually thought uh, they were totally made up or maybe symbolic. Um, I had no experience of like subtle energy, um, anything like that. And voila, you know, around day 49, this sort of, I, I, it feels like a heatless, lightless flame that comes out of my forehead and kind of dances around. And, and, um, you know, for, again, for someone who had, who didn't believe in any of this stuff, that was really shocking to me that, that there's this thing, this clear, that was the first indication for me that, wow, we really don't know a lot about the human body. You know, there's really something here that we have no clue about. Um, and it started with my forehead um, and then gradually all the other chakras lit up. This is one of the earliest depictions I could find of the chakras. Um, it's from a Tibetan Buddhist mural from I think the 1700s, but it might've been early, it might be earlier. And, um, you know, all of them lit up. They didn't do so in sequence, I think, I think typically it's supposed to go from bottom to top. Uh, this guy doesn't even have an Ajna chakra. I don't know why, but I had a, I had one right here, right in the middle of my forehead. And then um, right at the base of the spine, I, I guess that's this middle one here. I still don't know everything, right? I'm still kind of like in the dark a little bit. I don't know all the terminology. Um, started to feel like a hot coal at the base of my spine. And every time I would breathe, it would react to my breathing, uh, much to my surprise. And, um, and then I did start to feel like a little sort of tendril moving up my spine, although it was not explosive at all, but you, I could feel it, you know, very much almost like an electrical current was sort of gradually moving up. And um, uh, what happened next is I started to feel these spontaneous sort of um, vibrations that would, um, at first I thought somebody had like a massager or something like a foot massager. I was at work doing, doing my normal like, uh, engineering job sitting there. And I thought like, if someone turned on like a foot massager, I'm like starting to feel like, like I'm buzzing kind of, and no, there was no, no one in my office had a foot, a foot massager. And, um, you know, uh, it just sort of would ebb and flow. And, um, I thought, well, this is strange. Uh, I actually, it, it felt electrical. I've actually had the unfortunate experience of being mildly electrical shocked by an alternating current and um, didn't do it. It didn't hurt me at all. I was, I was a kid. I just, I didn't stick my finger into the socket, but there was a miswired outlet on a, on a, a, a metal uh, countertop. And I was probably 10 or 11 and I touched it and I think my feet were in water or something. And it just felt, it was just buzzing. It's this alternate, you know, alternating current um, is like, it's buzzing. And, uh, and I was like, wow. And this is exactly what that felt like in a, in a very funny way. It was like an AC current. And I thought, man, well, this is, uh, it kind of like feels like this is all leading up to something, but I really didn't have any idea what, I mean, I kind of had some idea, but what happened, I had no idea uh, what was gonna happen. And what, what ended up happening is, and this is a diagram 
um, from the same Tibetan mural that I was mentioning before. And what you're seeing here, some of you can probably interpret this readily. What, what this is, is a meditator and he's, he's humming his, uh, his syllable, I guess a mantra. And he's got this, um, you, know, you can kind of see what I call full bars, right? Full, full Kundalini bars uh, in his spine and the two side channels. And he, there's an explosion that's happening out of the top of his head. And what you can see is he, uh, th these are little, these little squiggles look a lot like vibrations to me. And everything, you know, has these squiggles. I think that's fairly intentional. I don't think that's like a stylistic choice. Um, this is like an informational diagram. And he goes into, you know, there's like a pagoda here. There's some water. It's like another world. And that was, I found this later. I found this after this happened. Um, I was, uh, I was on the couch. I was laying there. It was in the morning. I had woken up, but I was still kind of laying on the couch, feeling these vibrations that were like surging. And what happened is they surged up so fast that I could just hold on for dear life. It was like the first drop in a roller coaster where you're just like, here we go. And um, there was a spinning sensation. Like my entire, from the center of my awareness was just whipping around an incredible centrifugal force and faster and faster and faster. And I'm just like bracing myself, like, oh my God. And then this boom, and I just, I felt my awareness just shoot out of the top of my head, almost exactly like this. And I, I was so freaked out by it, but I was also kind of excited because I'm like, Oh, you know, <laughs> something's happening. <laughs> Something is definitely happening here. Um, and I'm also like, where am I going to end up? You know, what happens next? And I'd had this out of body. You know, when I mentioned, I mentioned when I was 18, I had this out of body experience. So I knew, I knew what that was like, but that wasn't like this. This was, this was different. Um, and I sort of opened my eyes, so to speak. And I was, um, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what happened uh, because this is sort of for science. And I feel like if I don't say what happened, I would be, you know, it'd be a terrible story. Number one. And number two, um, I think this is important that people talk about these experiences, even if they're really weird. So what happened is, is I came to in this sort of cloudy, nondescript environment. I was completely lucid. Um, I could no longer feel the couch. I had during the spinning, I could feel that I was laying on the couch, and but I no longer felt the couch. Um, I didn't check to see if I had a body or anything. I was just kind of like, okay, what happens next? And there were, it was cloudy. I couldn't see very well. And um, what appeared in front of me was something that looked like this. I've done, I've, like I said, I did some graphic design. So I have sort of reproduced what this object looked like. It sort of opened up radially in front of me and was had these vivid colors. It looked, I remember it looked like the wheel of fortune because it had this text. It was sort of the, uh, along, along each wedge. Each wedge had a sort of um, funny script. And since I'm a Star Trek fan, I thought immediately, I was like, oh, I wonder if this is Klingon. And I bet, you know, I've watched a lot of Star Trek. Probably what's happening here is my brain is kind of like coming up with this and um, it's going to be Klingon. And I like looked in and I was like, whoa, I have never seen those characters before. Uh, you know, and I've seen, you know, Mandarin, Cantonese and Japanese. I'm like familiar with a little enough to know what they look like. Uh, Korean, you know, uh, Indonesian, right? Like I've seen all those scripts and this was like, it looked like about like this, right? You cannot, you, you know, you've never seen these symbols before. Um, and it was like, it was waiting kind of for an instruction or it was a sign. I, I knew I was supposed to maybe do something or I didn't want to touch it. Cause I was like, God, what if I touch it? And I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Um, I was also kind of overwhelmed. Um, and so I just kind of was like, oh, maybe I'm just not going to touch anything, you know, very engineer kind of reaction. Like just, just don't touch anything. Um, and, uh, and it, it sort of paused. Cause I was like, you know what, um, I don't feel any different. I didn't feel, I just felt like myself, but I'm in this totally different world. And I thought that was strange. You know, I was like, well, I thought you were supposed to feel enlightened or something, you know, whenever this happens, it shows you how much I know. And, um, and I heard a voice say, this is not a very high yogic plane. <laughs> and I laughed. And at the second I laughed, I was like, boom, back on my couch. And I woke up and I was like, oh my God, like, what was that? Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so 
I, I just, um, yeah, that's the, this is not a very high yoga plane. I thought that was hilarious. And it just didn't, because it didn't feel like a very, you know, didn't, I didn't feel terribly enlightened. Um, and so, so that was kind of the climactic event um, that I'm still trying to decipher and interpret. I learned it's called astral projection. You know, I learned it's not totally uncommon. Um, I learned it's not enlightenment. You know, there's a lot of things that kind of like I had to kind of piece together and we sort of um, are doing our best to kind of interview people that are more familiar with these topics than I am in, in the film to kind of help us understand as viewers, like, what is this, right? And, uh, you know, there's some similarity, for example, to DMT, uh, the chemical in your brain can also produce out-of-body experiences, but not usually like this, uh, but there are some similarities. So the question is like, like, what is this, you know? Um, and for me, it's like this answer of like, oh, it's just chemicals in your brain. You know, it's kind of like, it doesn't get you anywhere toward understanding, number one, why meditation caused this. I'd like to know that, right? Okay, so it's DMT why does sitting still just cause this to happen? Um, and, uh, and then it's also like, I feel like it's like say, saying to an astronaut, like, oh, you know, you think you went to the moon. You think you had this rocket ride. That's all just your brain coming up with this. You know, it doesn't get you any closer to understanding. Like what you want to know is like, how, how is this experience connected to everything else in our lives? And how, how can we explore this? And how can we um, learn more about this? Um, because if there is an alternate dimension that's just, um, you know, a few hundred days of meditation away, then people should know about that. You know, that's a big deal. Uh, so, um, so, so that's kind of where, where we're going in the film. The, la the last thing that happened, I'll mention, um, is that this was a, a few hundred days after. There was sort of a long hiatus after that point at which I would do the meditation and my chakras would always kind of light up. But... Um, either I couldn't get back to the, the vibrational explosion um, or I would get halfway there and then it would kind of fizzle out. Like it would, like it couldn't have, like it needed enough fuel to actually get the full, you know, lift off. Like it was literally a rocket um, and I could never quite get there. Uh, and again, partly maybe because I had, I had, I had broken celibacy um, and things like that. But ultimately what happened is I experienced about 45 minutes of what I would consider to be, and what other people have told me is higher consciousness, uh, a higher conscious state. And um, uh, I could go on and on about it. I, I, I we're running a little bit short on time, I think. So I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe keep it short. But um, it was sort of the classic experience where you normally experience yourself as a small I, the sense of self, right, in Atman to use the yogic term in this infinite universe. And what happened for 45 minutes was it was like everything did this, I'm showing a polar panorama here where it's like everything coalesced into this small ball. Um, and it was like, I was the infinite universe. My awareness became infinite, not just like spatially infinite, but temporally infinite because as we know, space time are, are, are linked. And it was as though I was sitting outside of the infinity of space-time watching it as almost this insignificant show. Like life was, I remember thinking like, oh, you know, this, the, what this beautiful little dollhouse world and all our beautiful little people, you know, done in our lives that we're living. And, and really the universe, we're just like this minute fraction and it's okay like you know <laughs> it's okay at the time trump was in the white house it's okay you know like it's everything's gonna be okay was basically the takeaway um and that is a really comforting thing you know to not kind of know that like you're outside of this this cosmic show and um to feel like it can't touch you um was a was a tremendous experience I, like i get why it's sometimes called liberation because if nothing else, I feel like um, I feel liberated from feeling so worried about life, um, which I guess I was a pretty anxious guy beforehand. So, uh, and we deal with all of this in the film. I'm gonna go through the next slides fairly quickly because I think we are running out of time. But um, the next thing that happened is uh, <laughs> we had a baby and um, the film got put on hold for a long time. Uh, there was also this thing, I don't know if you've heard of it, The the global pandemic, 
Um, a lot of things have happened in the meantime that have sort of stalled the film out and meant that we have had to put it on the back burner. Um, but now we're getting started again, um, trying to capture the, the sort of second half of this story, which is, okay, something happened to you. Now, how do you integrate that into your life? And what do you do with this? Um, especially being a new father, uh, you know, that can be a big challenge. And um, so we are, and, and, and every character in the film, uh, Scott, JJ, Myrna, like they're all also dealing with similar, you know, a similar question of what do I do with this and how does my life change as a result? And I'm certainly dealing with that as well um, from the perspective of, of being a parent. So that's kind of how the film resolves itself. Um, and along the way, we have all kinds of interviews with all kinds of leading experts. We're actually still looking for more. So um, if you want to appear in the film, if this seems like the kind of film where you're like, oh, I could really provide some really good insight for this, um, please email me. Um, I would love to talk to you. Uh, if you've had a spiritual experience, we're mostly done with people. Like we were, the characters we're following, we kind of picked in the beginning. And so it's hard to like put someone new in at the end. Um, but it's not to say that we couldn't, and, and my mind is always open. So uh, if our editor says we can do it, then we can do it. So please reach out to me. Um, and, and like I said, we're, the film is ultimately about people, and it's about um, how you can integrate a spiritual experience into your lives. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we go. And I want to go back to, I know I'm a little bit out of time. I want to go back to this slide. Uh, you know, the goals here is to create a film that can be enjoyed by everyone. You know, it's a film that um, you shouldn't be afraid to tell your it's normal, you know, it's a terrible word, but like you shouldn't be able to tell your friends who have not had a spiritual experience. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid to tell them about it. You should, you should be able to say, hey, look at this. Like, this is what I've been talking about. This is what happened to me. And maybe it's not exactly what happened to you, right? But we're trying to get a wide range so that we can, um, so that people who feel like they've, been sort of clo spiritually closeted and unable to talk about their experiences can feel like, hey, here's something I can share with my skeptical friends. Um, and we think hopefully this will help bring people that have had spiritual experiences out of the woodwork. I'm sure there are tons of people in the sciences who don't dare talk about their experiences because, oh, well, they're going to lose funding or they're, you know, they're going to, uh, people are going to criticize them. And, and maybe if we do this right, that um, people can start talking more openly about their experiences. Um, I think there needs to be a spiritual Me Too movement. You know, we're a subculture that uh, needs to see its its day in the sun, um, and really, I don't think has yet. Uh, and, and we need we need to destigmatize this idea of um, that that spirituality is kooky and that it's not science friendly and that you know all these things. And I think we're so close. You know, with with meditation and yoga being so mainstream now, the next step is to get spiritual experiences. You know, get this iceberg up out of the water. Um, and so that's what I'm really trying to do here. Uh, we're fortunate to have a wonderful crew. You can, you can see more on the website. Um, I know I'm, I'm over time, so I'm going to try to wrap up. Uh, Josh Eisenberg did slow-mo. He's had some films go to Netflix. Um, he's fantastic, uh, has a ton of connections, and is super excited about this project. Melissa Niedich uh, is similar. She's uh, almost did not win an Academy Award, but did very well with the 2000 film Dark Days. Um, she has had a spiritual experience herself, and so is you know really really understands the subject, uh, which is rare. Um, and uh, and then me, I'm the director. I'm just sort of like the de facto director. This is my first film. I I'm a software engineer mostly. I'm leaning heavily on Josh and Melissa to kind of put this together um, and get it get it into shape, so that hopefully we'll get this on Netflix or you know um, any network that we you know the best the biggest network we can find, the biggest distribution that we can get to get this out there. And I think we have the right crew to do that. And um, the only thing we need is is uh, cold hard cash. <laughs> um, you know, this, this film has already raised uh, a good deal of money um, from a, a few really, really motivated sponsors. And, and that's usually what it takes for a, a niche kind of film. We're doing some fundraising on the website right now. Um, and, and this might be the kind of film that if we got the whole spiritual community together and we're like, this is the film that you have to support and it's gonna help you know, bring this topic into the open, we might get that kind of a crowdfunding effect. But, but usually, and I'm gonna try to do that, but, but usually it's, um, it's, it's you know, five to 10 
really motivated people, um, you know, giving in, in, in larger increments. Um, so I hope that's what we'll find. And hopefully in 2023, we'll be able to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, the next time I'll email you or say, uh, hey, you can go on Netflix and watch Super Meditate Me and um, tell your friends that uh, spirituality is not a crime. So thank you very much. Uh, my email is on the website and it's supermeditate.me. Um, you can check it out and we'll keep you in the loop. Thanks everyone. Take care.